and welcome back to chapter 13. In this chapter, we are talking about passing on life's information, DNA structure, and replication. We are going to start with section two from chapter 13 on Watson and Crick and the double helix. So when scientists were trying to decipher the structure of DNA, so they knew there was something there passing on the hereditary material, um, but they didn't know anything about the structure yet, there were two scientists named Watson and Crick, and they were performing work in something called molecular biology. And molecular biology is the investigation of life at the level of its individual molecules. So looking at the small structures within the human body or within any living organism. So water is a molecule, um, sugar is a molecule. So trying to look at those different molecules and figuring out what exactly is DNA and what is it made up of. Um, so this investigation of life was at the level of its individual molecules, trying to look at these small pieces. Molecular biology has grown greatly in importance since the 1950s. And Watson and Crick met in the early 1950s at Cambridge University in England and set about to decipher the structure of DNA. They discovered the chemical structure of DNA in 1953. This is their model of DNA here. And in that picture, this event ushered in a new era in biology because it allowed researchers to understand some of the most fundamental um, processes in genetics. Watson and Crick's research was aided by the work of other scientists, such as Rosalind Franklin here in the picture on the left, and she was using X-ray diffraction to learn about DNA structure here. So um, this picture here is showing a picture of um, an X-ray diffraction image of DNA at that time. And so all of these pieces that they were able to put together at this time in molecular biology and in images helped them to figure out the structure of DNA. And next in section 13.3, we'll look at the components of DNA and how these components are arranged. The DNA molecule is composed of building blocks called nucleotides. And a nucleotide is this piece here in this blue box. And it consists of a phosphate group, which is this right here, a phosphorus atom surrounded by some oxygen and a hydrogen. So it's this phosphate group. This is the sugar group, which is in red here. The sugar is called deoxyribose. So when you look at the term DNA, it stands for deoxyribo, which is for the sugar. And then N is for nucleic acid, which are um, these bases here, nucleic, because they have a um, this nitrogen in them. So Again, DNA is composed of building blocks called nucleotides, so it's repeating segments of this phosphate, sugar, and something which is called a nucleotide base. And there can be four different nucleotide bases. There is adenine, which we abbreviate A, thymine, which we abbreviate T, guanine, which we abbreviate G, and cytosine, which we abbreviate C. And the order of these bases is what's going to determine your genetic code and tell your cells um, what proteins to produce. So again, each nucleotide consists of one phosphate group, one sugar deoxyribose, and in one of four bases, adenine, guanine, thymine, or cytosine, so A, G, T, and C. The sugar and phosphate groups are linked together in chains that form the handrails of the DNA double helix. So the outside of the DNA is sort of these rails. So it looks somewhat like a ladder that's been twisted and the sugar and phosphate make up these outer rails. Bases extend inward from the handrails with base pairs joined to each other in the middle by hydrogen bonds. Um, I think we talked about hydrogen bonds in Bio 101, but that's a bond that forms between a weak bond between hydrogen atoms due to differences in electrical charge charges. So there's a weak bond here. If you look at these atoms here, they have some hydrogens surrounding them. So all of them have some of these hydrogens surrounding them, and that gives those hydrogens will um, slightly negative end will attach to a slightly positive end and bond here together and hold the two handrails and their associated bases together. In Base pairing, 
A always pairs with T across the helix. So if you have an adenine, it will always pair with thymine. So if you have adenine on one side, there will be thymine on the other side, and vice versa. If there's a thymine here, there would be an adenine here. And G always pairs with C. So guanine always will pair with cytosine, and they call this base pairing. Again, because these are called um, bases. We talked a bit before in previous chapters looking at cell division and talked how, about how DNA needs to replicate. And again, DNA replication is important because the DNA will replicate before the cell splits in two. So let's look at here a little more detail on how that DNA replicates. So DNA is copied by means of each strand of DNA separating. So we have our two strands of DNA, one on this side and one on this side. And the DNA strands will separate and then they will each serve as a template for the synthesis, sorry, the synthesis of a new complementary strand. And what that means is they form as sort of the, the key or the model and a new strand will be formed on here. Complementary just means that it's the bases that go with this side. So what happens is your, your two strands first separate and then there are some proteins that will add on the new bases to the other strand. And so if you have a G here, then the protein will add on C to that because again, G and C pair up and it will add on A to the T because A and T pair up a T to the A, and so it goes down, um, it goes just base by base, adding on bases to the existing strand until eventually you have a completely new strand. And it does the same thing to the other side, so you go from having one strand of DNA to two strands of DNA, which if you look at them, they are exactly the same. And that's the goal is that your um, cells will make exact copies of the existing DNA because again your DNA is your code telling your body everything it needs to know so when it gets duplicated you need an exact copy. Each double helix produced in replication is a combination of one parental strand of DNA and one newly synthesized again complementary strand just the strand that goes with it. Um, so all this means is when your DNA separates the new the two new pieces of DNA have one piece of the old DNA, so the old DNA here, and then new DNA built onto it. A group of enzymes known as DNA polymerases um, are central to DNA replication. So these enzymes move along the double helix and they bond together the new nucleotides in complementary DNA strands. So as um, different different proteins come along and add on your bases here. So they bring the base in and they add it on. They'll bring another base here and add it on. So after they've added the bases and they've put them there, this DNA polymerase is almost like a clamp and it goes over and it connects the two bases together and it just moves along down the strand of DNA connecting the bases together. DNA can encode for um, can encode the information for a huge number of proteins used by living things because of the sequence of bases along DNA's handrails. And they can be laid out in an extremely varied manner. So if you look at a huge strand of DNA, um, anytime you put together the bases in a different order, you get a different protein produced. And so by just four bases, you can get a huge variety of um, proteins produced that all can do different things in your body. A collection of bases in one order encodes the information for one protein. So for example, if you had AAA, it would make a certain protein and the bases get read three proteins at a time. So if you had AAA, you'd get one protein. If you had AAT, um, you'd get a different protein. And obviously any, any different order of bases would produce a different protein. Next up in section 3.4, we'll look at mutations. So what happens when one of those bases in your DNA changes? When, when one of those bases changes, we call that a mutation. So the error in rate of DNA replication is very low, partly because repair enzymes are able to co correct mistakes. So there are repair enzymes that go along, they read that DNA code, and if they find a 
if they find an error in that DNA code, then they will repair it. But if such if mistakes are made and not corrected, we call that a mutation. So if your if your series of bases was originally AAA and it gets copied over and your new DNA strand that gets copied is AAT, we would call that a mutation. A mutation just means there is a change um, in the DNA code. And if that change stays and doesn't get repaired, then it's a permanent alteration in that cell's DNA base sequence. So it doesn't change all the DNA in all your cells, it would change the DNA in that one particular cell. So again, um, the error rate in DNA replication is very low because these repair enzymes usually will find the mistakes and fix them. So let's say that this is your starting DNA here. We have um, we have G, T, C, G, C, T on this side, and the DNA separates and gets a new strand gets added. And instead of making, originally it was C, A, G, C, G, A, and instead of it makes C, A, G, T, G, A. So it puts a T here, um, pulls a protein, pulls the wrong base in, matches a T up with a G. Your Enzymes go along to fix that, but instead of fixing the T, they fix the other side, the G. So they go, this isn't right to have G and T together. So they go take out this G and put an A there instead. So A and T pair up. Your enzymes could possibly think that that's correct at this point and leave this difference here. So this was our original strand with C and G at that point. Now we have A and T at this point. When there is a change at just one point in your DNA, so one base has changed, we call that a point mutation. Most mutations won't have an effect on an organism, um, but when they do have an effect, it's generally negative. So oftentimes if the mutation is severe enough that the cell can't function, the cell will just die. Um, and in that case, you wouldn't even know that there was a mutation that occurred. That cell would die off. Um, occasionally, there are mutations that cause the proteins produced to be just slightly different, and there is some negative consequence to that. Um, for example, cancer results from um, cells that have undergone a type of mutation that causes them to continually divide. So normally in your DNA sequence, there is a code and then there's a stop, a series of three bases that say stop. And it tells that cell that you've done your job that you need to do, stop for a while, and then eventually um, the code will be read again and a new protein will be produced. But if you, if you don't have that stop series of bases, and the cell just continues to grow and grow and grow and never stop growing and continue to divide, that's when you get a group of, um, essentially one of your cells has become cancerous. It just that one cell continues to grow and divide without stopping and sort of takes over. So that's one example of um, a mutation that would be negative. You can have mutations that can lead to changes in um, eye color and your height. You can have all kinds of different mutations that may not be negative, but oftentimes when a change is made to your DNA, it's usually the wrong um, thing gets produced and something, some negative um, thing happens as a consequence of that. Some mutations will come about in the body's germline cells, and these are the cells that will become eggs or sperm. So if a mutation occurs in a cell that's about to be made into a sperm or an egg cell, um, then that mutation will be passed on to, um, your, to the offspring, so from one generation to the next. So if there's a mutation that occurs in a cell that's um, in the process of becoming an egg, so the meiosis is being under, undergone, um, a mutation occurs, and that egg has a mutation in it, then that egg will divide and divide and divide and grow into a new living organism. And every cell in that living organism will now have that mutation. So we talked earlier about most mutations occur in one cell in your body and don't affect your whole body. But if those mutations occur in your egg or your sperm cell, then they get passed on to um, the next generation. We'll talk a little bit later about x-ray radiation, but that's one reason why they'll put in a shield over um, 
that part of your body to protect your egg and your sperm cells um, because they don't want that radiation to hit the egg and sperm cells and cause a mutation that will then be passed on to your potential offspring. One mutation that leads to a negative consequence is um, a mutation in a gene and it leads to something called Huntington disease and it's that disease is expressed in the nerve cells and it's a heritable mutated form of a normal gene. So Huntington disease may appear in early childhood, but it normally appears in a person's 30s or 40s. Early symptoms, essentially the brain is, it's, it's breaking down the brain. And so there's a lot of consequences because of that. Um, early symptoms can include irritability, depression, small involuntary movements, twitches, poor coordination, and then trouble with learning and thinking and everything associated with that because the brain is beginning to not function. As it progresses, there may be trouble walking, speaking, swallowing, and declining ability to think and reason and other personality changes. Individuals with adult onset form of Huntington disease usually live about 15 to 20 years after signs and symptoms begin. And so one problem with this disease is that it typically occurs later in the adult life and people when they have children, they don't know that they have the disease yet unless they've kept track of the disease through their family history. And so someone may have children and then in their 30s or 40s realize that they have this disease and pass the disease on to their children. Um, the disease can also occur um, in juveniles and that form tends to be more serious and develop more rapidly. So what's going on with Huntington disease is that there, here is one of your chromosomes here. And there's this specific gene right here. This is where the Huntington disease um, problem occurs. And what happens is that Huntington, people with adult onset Huntington disease typically have 40 to 50 CAG repeats. So they have cytosine, adenine, guanine. That repeats about 40 to 50 times in this particular gene. And so they have, when they have more than 35 of that repeat, then it produces um, this polyglutamine and it produces this protein called polyglutamine and that polyglutamine causes the decline in um, brain, the brain. So if there are 40 to 50 repeats, then people will usually, the disease will show up in, at, at, sorry, as an adult. If they have 60 or more, repeats of CAG, again, those are the basis, cytosine, adenine, guanine, then the disease shows up sooner because there is going to be more of this protein that causes problems produced. And so the juvenile form leads to a more rapid decline because they just have more of this protein that is not good for their brain, that causes problems in the brain. Now, if you look here, it's um, at the pedigree. It's an autosomal dominant inheritance. So autosomal means it's not um, in the X and Y chromosome and it's dominant. So if a parent, um, if you have one copy of the gene, then it will show up. So when you have a person who has the gene and a person who doesn't have the gene, um, so someone with Huntington disease, one parent and one parent doesn't have Huntington disease, then half the children would end up with getting that gene and it would show up because it's dominant. Most mutations, however, come about um, not in the body's um, egg or sperm, but in the body's somatic cells, and that's just your other body cells. And as dangerous as these mutations may be, so you may get a mutation that's dangerous to you, but they can't be passed along to your offspring. So if you get a mutation, um, Throughout the course of your life, it may cause problems in your own body, um, but unless it happens to, unless the mutation is in your egg or sperm cell, it will not be passed along to your offspring. Mutations can come about through the effect of mutagens, and these are substances such as cigarette smoke, ultraviolet light, and other things that can mutate DNA. And there's a lot of substances that can mutate DNA. And the picture to the right shows some different examples of things that can mutate DNA. Um, so I think we all know UV radiation can lead to skin cancer. And the reason for that is it can cause that radiation hits and it causes that DNA to um, be duplicated wrong. So that, that UV light hits, causes that DNA to 
be copied wrong and then can lead to abnormal cell growth in that area where the um, mutation occurred. X-rays um, also give off radi radiation. Different types of X-rays give off different amounts. Um, and again, that's why, as I said, they put shields over certain areas in your body um, to try to prevent radiation from especially hitting your um, egg and sperm cells and uh, making sure that you don't get a mutation that's going to be passed on to your offspring. There are, so radiation is one thing that can cause a mutation in your body. Um, chemicals can also cause mutations in your body, such as um, cigarette smoke. Smoke contains dozens of different mutagenic chemicals, so chemicals, dozens of different chemicals that in each one of them can cause mutations in your body. Um, nitrates and nitrate preservatives and things such as hot dogs and processed meat. Um, not all hot dogs are processed meat, but a lot of hot dogs and processed meat, like bacon and lunch meat, will have nitrates in them. And it's used as a sort of a salt, used as a preservative. Um, but those chemicals can cause mutations as well, especially to your stomach lining since they go through your stomach. Um, barbecuing can also create, so extremely high heat on your food can also create mutagenic chemicals in food. And then other chemicals such as um, benzoyl peroxide, which is a common ingredient in acne products. Um, a lot of different chemicals that can cause mutations, but that's some examples there. And then also infectious agents. So um, bacteria and viruses can cause mutations in your body. And we'll talk about those coming up soon, but the HPV or human papillomavirus can cause, um, which is a sexually transmitted virus that can cause mutations. Helicobacter pylori, which you might hear um, if you ever had a test done for that, is H. pylori is a bacteria that's spread through contaminated food, and it can oftentimes the main symptom will be that it can lead to ulcers in the stomach lining. And so sometimes if you're having ulcers, they'll test for that um, so they can treat you for that bacteria. But it can also lead to changes in the cells in the stomach lining and cause mutations in the stomach lining cells and those can um, eventually have the potential to become cancerous. So um, all of these different things here are examples of things that can cause uh, mutations in your body. Um, so let's first talk a little bit about while we're here x-rays and just get an idea of when we say x-rays can cause mutations 
um, the radiation that's naturally I'm going over here now that's naturally present on earth so not due to any human cause not due to anything we put on the earth but just radiation that naturally exists in our atmosphere is about 3.1 msv is just a unit of reser um, sorry a unit of radiation it's about 3.1 msv per year a standard x-ray has about 0 0.1 msv of radiation that you're getting at one time so now again radiation in the atmosphere you're getting this amount over an entire year so it's spread out um, an x-ray you're getting that radiation not a huge amount but in a little more concentrated than if you were just outside in the air a ct scan has about 7 msv um, per ct scan so a little over double what you'd normally get in a year from being out in the atmosphere um, airline being in an airplane also creates radiation and one airline trip has a total exposure of about 0 0.02 so quite a bit less than say an x-ray msv a full-time pilot's exposed to about 2.2 msv per year and so um that's the reason why x-rays you're not just going to go have x-rays all the time just to for the fun of it um they do try to use them when the medical need exceeds the risk of saying well there is some radiation from the x-ray but there is a good medical need of why this needs to be done so it's not a huge um, x-rays are not a huge exposure to radiation but again there is some risk from that radiation and that's why certain areas especially get covered up to produce prevent um, areas that we don't want um, really don't want mutations to occur So let's look at HPV, the human papillomavirus, and how um, that mutation comes from a virus and what goes on there. So human papillomavirus is one example of a virus that can cause mutations in cervical cells. So this is just in females. Um, if females get human papill papillomavirus, which males can get it too, but males don't have cervical cells. So um, this, this specific mutation becomes a problem in females. 
and the human papillomavirus causes the production of two proteins. And what these proteins do is they turn off some tumor suppressor genes. So normally you have genes in your DNA, which will help, they will, they will see that tumor growth and they will stop that tumor from growing if a tumor were to grow. But when you get human papillomavirus, you can get the production of these proteins. And then when tumors start to form, there's no stop mechanism. There's nothing there to, um, or not, not as much there to stop them from growing. So this can allow the cervical lining cells to grow too much and develop changes that may lead to cancer. Most women with human papillomavirus don't get cervical cancer, but most all women with cervical cancer um, got it from, had the human papillomavirus, and that's where it came from. So um, it's not just because you have human papillomavirus does not mean that you're going to get cervical cancer, but there is a higher risk of getting it if you have human papillomavirus. And so they do something called a pap smear in women to look at the cervical cells. We'll talk about that on the next slide and keep an eye out for changes that may indicate that you um, have human papillomavirus and that changes are occurring to those cells. So on, when you get a pap smear and they take cells from your cervix and look at them under a microscope, this is what they see. So when they're telling you that you have a normal pap smear or an abnormal pap smear, um, normal means that the cervical cells are, um, they are um, regular shape and they have one small nucleus inside them. So we've Hopefully you remember we've talked about cell structure and the cells have a nucleus inside of them. Um, normally the nucleus is small and normally you have one nucleus. So slightly abnormal cervical cells are shown in this picture. So you have the blue normal cervical cells here and this is a um, this is cervical cells from a pap smear that are starting to get abnormal. So the cell here is becoming larger. The nucleus here, you can see a nucleus here and another nucleus here. So the, the nuclei inside the cell, nuclei is just plural for nucleus, they are getting larger. So here's a normal nucleus and here's the nucleus here. And we have two of them and they're getting larger. So that's an indication that changes are starting to occur. It's not yet at this point cancerous, but it could become cancerous if not treated. So they can, um, if they catch, if they see that you have this stage here, um, they can remove those cells from the cervix and um, try to get rid of the cells at that point. Here on the right are cells that have become extremely abnormal, so um, definitely cancerous. Here, highly abnormal cells, they have very large nuclei. The nuclear margins are irregular, so it's hard to even see the clear distinct cells because the margins have gotten the, the edges of that nuclear membrane are not nice and um, smooth anymore. The, um, the margins, the nuclear margins stain um, a dark, very dark bluish green. So the color of your nucleus here is darker. Again, the shape of the nucleus um, is, is not nice and round anymore. Um, and this, at this stage, you definitely need to be treated quickly before it escapes the boundaries of the cervix. So once it gets to this phase, those cells will just start growing anywhere around that area and can start spreading to other organs and other parts of the body. And so um, when you get a pap smear and here, here a normal or slightly abnormal or um, hopefully not highly abnormal, but that um, in any case, this would be what they're looking at when they look at those slides. And again, this is caused by um, the HPV virus causing a mutation to the DNA. Cervical cancer used to be the leading cause of cancer-related deaths in women in the U.S. Over the last 40 years, due to pap screening, that number has significantly decreased. So when a woman gets a pap screen and checks those cervical cells for changes, it can help with early detection and early treatment and catch the cancer before it spreads, but it does not um, reduce your risk of getting HPV. 
by doing the pap screening. So they um, came up with not too long ago the HPV vaccine, and that helps prevent people from actually getting the HPV virus. And when they don't get the HPV virus, there's almost no chance that they will get almost completely eliminates the risk of them getting cervical cancer because almost all cervical cancers are caused by HPV. Now, again, um, just because you have HPV, the human papillomavirus, does not mean that you're going to get cervical cancer. It's just that if you didn't have that virus, you're, it's almost guaranteed you won't get cervical cancer. So um, that vaccine was helpful in um, reducing that um, basically eliminating the possibility that you're going to get HPV and then um, therefore eliminating the possibility that you'd get cervical cancer. As we mentioned, um, mutations can be, normally will be negative, but occasionally the mutations could be indifferent or good. And so mutations have been important to evolution because they are the only means um, through which a complete, completely new genetic information can be added to a species genome. So if you wonder how we see changes in species, these changes come about through mutations. So lots of mutations will occur, lots of those animals will, or plants will die, but occasionally there will be a mutation that will be, um, that will stick around. It won't cause them to die, um, it won't cause problems, and it may cause something that's advantageous for, advantageous to that organism. So um, the accidental reorderings of DNA sequences that mutations bring about can, in rare instances, produce new proteins that are useful to organisms. So, for example, if you have a series of genes that um, have something to do with an organism's speed, and this is an organism that survives by running from predators, and this mutation causes them to, um, their muscles to be structured slightly differently or their legs to be longer and gives them an advantage over other organisms, um, then you'd be seeing a mutation that occurred that was beneficial to the organism and will help, and that organism then is more likely to survive and have offspring and pass on that new trait to the rest of the population. And so again, changes in organisms um, they occur through mutations to the DNA that instead of being negative are, um, would be in that case positive. And that is the end of our chapter 13 lecture. So I will um, be back in touch with you again for chapter 14 next week.